Life can change in a matter of seconds. Now it's highly likely that a tornado is on the ground. Take cover now. 911, what's the address of the emergency? Nine people are dead after an active shooter opens fire in the Oregon district. Or you don't think it's going to happen to you. The summer of 2019 was one of the most devastating Dayton, Ohio has ever seen. But Dayton is no stranger to tragedy. Since its beginning, the city has contended with events such as a cholera epidemic in the 1800s, the Great Flood of 1913, and the loss of thousands of manufacturing jobs in the 1970s and 80s. In recent years, the city faced an opioid crisis that was judged by many to be the worst in the country. Dayton has had its fair share of trials. But when two tragedies struck the city in less than two months, Dayton faced its biggest challenge yet. On May 28, 2019, 15 tornadoes ravaged through the Dayton region. Then, on August 4th, a gunman opened fire outside of a bar in the city's Oregon district, killing nine people. Dayton, a city that is often overlooked, made national headlines twice in one summer. But to those who live here, the city is so much more than what the news shows. I've always found it to be kind of what I call like a Goldilocks town. It's not too big and not too small. It's just right. I, you know, I've got to tell you, Dayton is a very special place. And just the people in general are just very kind around this area. Locals are very proud to call Dayton home which creates a bond that even the toughest challenges cannot break. But this summer would definitely challenge the city's strength. This summer began as any other, with Memorial Day. While people were celebrating the holiday weekend, the weather was pleasant. No one could see the major storm brewing on the horizon. You know, my family, they went to Springfield to hang out with their family for Memorial Day. So while they were down there, I was up here resting. But it was a nice day, the whole day. And then when they got back home, the rain started coming. Just thinking it was just a regular Ohio, typical rainy day. My 16-year-old came into my room at about 11 o'clock and he showed me his phone. He had the weather map on his phone and he said, should we be getting into the basement? And I said, oh no, that doesn't happen here. You know, tornadoes don't impact you know, highly populated areas typically. But as more and more tornado warnings were sent out, there was a feeling that this was more serious than anyone thought. So as we were moving through the five and six o'clock newscast, I was starting to feel a little bit more leery that we were going to have more than just one or two, that we were gonna have several more. But of course I could never say 15 of them are going to happen. I still didn't connect that it was actually happening here. It was, I, I, I knew it was happening, but it wasn't gonna happen here. Later in the evening, multiple reports and warnings showed that several tornadoes were on track to travel through states in the Midwest. In all, officials issued 36 tornado warnings, one flash flood warning, and recorded multiple instances of golf ball sized hail in the Dayton area. I'm serious, get to your safe spot. You need to be in the lowest interior part of a sturdy structure, get there now. The day of May 27th, we had a warm front that moved through. Then we also had an area of low pressure and that creates rotation of the winds from the ground all the way up into the atmosphere. Around 11 p.m., the first of over a dozen tornadoes touched down in the Dayton metropolitan area. In all, the tornadoes had wind speeds of up to 170 miles per hour, enough to flatten even the sturdiest of structures. You could feel the floor shake and you could feel the walls do this and it felt like somebody had a hold of this house trying to pull it up right off its pavement. It was horrible. It sounded like a freight train. Everyone tells you a tornado sounds like freight train. I don't remember the wind. I remember my kids screaming. The strongest tornado touched down west of Brookville 
and traveled southeast, ravaging the north side of Dayton. At the worst point of the storm, five million people were without power. While well, we're out there trying to break the, the tree apart so the first responders can get down the street, the officer says, hey, y'all need to seek back shelter. There's another tornado coming. So that's when we went back down there again. Then I'm just like, this is really serious. You could feel the pressure dropped as the windows blew in. But I remember my, my oldest daughter, she was crying, she was yelling. She said, like, Mommy, I'm so scared, I'm so scared. I don't remember the siren or anything, I just remember screaming. Over 300 people were injured, and one man in Salina, Ohio, lost his life after a car was thrown into his home due to strong winds. Well, I pulled up and the entire uh, side of the uh, brick area was totally blown off and you could just see the copier uh, sitting in the hallway where it was. And it was really wild because like whole walls would be torn off and the roof's gone and yet a clock would still be hanging on the wall, you know, still ticking. The tornadoes both physically and economically damaged Dayton and its neighboring cities. No exact number has been stated, but it's estimated that damage costs could reach between 900 million and $1.1 billion statewide. So our initial response was to coordinate disaster with cleaning supplies and personal care items like sunscreen and dish soap and gloves and um, anything that somebody might need to clean up their house or to have in case they had to walk out of their house with nothing but the clothes on their back. I mean, it's been amazing, the community, the way the community came together. I also saw like social cohesion really matters. People came out to check on everybody. Um, again, they don't, they don't know us and, and we don't know all of them, but, but it was, um, it was pretty good, uh, that they checked on everybody. So it was, it was very, uh, humane, I guess is what I want to say. The cleaning process was slowly dying down. That was the hardest process. So to me, that was a step of getting ahead. So I, I really thought I was getting ahead. But I wasn't. 911, what's the address of the emergency? Um, we're in the, uh, we're in downtown or 5th Street in Dayton, Ohio. There was spot fire, there was people hurt, there's somebody hurt. <laughs> Dayton police can now confirming for us nine people are dead, at least 16 others hurt after an active shooter opens fire in the Oregon district. August 4th, it was a nice night. It seemed pretty calm at the time. People out in the street, but usually down to Oregon was nice out like that. You see a lot of people, you know, yelling, having a good time, talking loud. The Oregon district is considered by many to be the heart of Dayton, made up of quaint shops, bars, and restaurants, it is frequented by many Daytonians. So we get in Newcombs, have some fun, drinking, dancing. My sister's husband's birthday was that day, so, you know, it was like a, it was just a little festivity that was going on, just a family affair. And I didn't know he was going there that night. He was supposed to be home in bed, but uh, he was compelled to go out and celebrate his birthday at 30 years old. Why not? I would have. Locals and friends went into the Oregon district with high spirits, only to leave with their lives changed forever. So while we were just standing there at the taco stand, I just see the shooter come down the side of Newcombs. He was walking and he was just shooting at anything and everything got moved. And as I'm running, I see like a lady and she got like blood all on her shirt or whatever. So like I instantly started panicking. So like, I'm not, I don't know what's going on, I don't know what to do. I'm just like, come on, man, let's get up out of here. Let's go. So uh, I get a little bit closer in detail and really analyze his body, I start to see the blood come behind his, his head, you know what I'm saying? So that's when I just realized that my dad been shot. I also saw a few people fall on my feet, a few of my friends, and saw a lot of people on the street that I personally know hurt. I mean, honestly, there was bullets being shot, and I, I zoned that whole area out. I was only concerned about what's in front of me. Those cops' reaction time was amazing that night. If it wasn't for them, none of us would be here. Officers were already in the area when the shooting started. So just 32 seconds after the first shot was fired, they were able to take the shooter down. Assign the officers 15 minutes at a time, get out of your car and walk around, right? 
So those officers in the Oregon district were on a foot patrol assignment. That's uh, amazing luck, the number of people that could have died, because if he would have gotten into Ned Peppers, we would have had hundreds of dead. If three, three minutes to five minutes would have been different, I don't know where I would be. University of Dayton student Trey Landers was unknowingly standing next to the gunman earlier in the night. It's, it's so crazy because I didn't know until somebody I, I knew had seen it on the news and said it to me. It could have happened while I was standing right next to him. I every day have visions of how he died on the street. And that's the first thing you think of every day. And then he's not coming back. You know, the thoughts that go through my head about that night are just, I should have been there to help him. I should have been there to, to save him. Once the, the EMS got there and the police got there, they grabbed me up because I wouldn't, couldn't, you couldn't pry me off of it. So they take me down to the corner and um, you see the white sheet get put over. And then I just lost. Play back what happened that night. I play back how um, the friend of mine was you know, taken down. I had my hand on because couldn't get him aside in time. And play back to try and second guess myself what I could have done to help. In the hours after the shooting, the community was also eager to help those affected in any way they could. Because people can't do something, they need to do something. Like, we just have a human need to be connected. I mean, it's just, especially during a crisis. For, for these situations to happen and to see how everybody came together was really eye-opening for a lot of people. The GoFundMe pages that were started for Logan, um, the Dayton Foundation doing what they did, the community in itself, um, the, the concert. The concert was just one of many relief efforts to support the victims of both the shooting and tornadoes. No one could have predicted either tragedy, but everyone came together to support those directly affected. We had two disasters here that could affect, that is affecting a lot of people. An average of 28% of those affected by mass shootings experience post-traumatic stress disorder related to the event. I mean, any traumatic event that's outside the realm of the normal human experience has the potential to cause PTSD. I've, you know, been diagnosed with PTSD, anxiety, depression, which I had none of those issues before until now. Like, I, I didn't cope with it well, obviously, because nobody will. It, it's hard to explain. You know, some days I can be around a whole bunch of people. Some days I don't want to be isolated, you know. That's why I seek my, my counseling. I don't sleep well. I have horrible nightmares. To this day, I still have them. Every Daytonian was affected by the mass shooting or the tornadoes in some way. This inspired the people of Dayton to come together and make the city bond stronger than ever. What's amazing to communities when they go through these kind of things, you would think that they would become fragmented and actually they get more cohesive. We had a strong, tight-knit community before these things happened, right? So it was easy to lean into each other and to look for support in your neighbors and your friends. The community here in Dayton, to me, is the best community I've ever been around. It's the strongest community by far than any community I've ever been a part of. Uh, we've been tested in Dayton through crises, and so uh, we know how to manage through a crisis now, uh, unfortunately, a little better than I'd like us to know how to do it. A natural disaster, a mass shooting. Each takes just minutes to inflict so much pain and suffering. One night can make an enormous difference in someone's life. One summer can make an enormous difference in one city, but it doesn't mean the end. We have to continue to uh, call America to do better. And I think that's what Dayton is doing. And I hope that's the message that comes out of Dayton. I want to be known like, man, Dayton's beautiful there, man. I see the love, I see the community, I see the support that everybody offers to each other when something happens. All them people that helped me during the time I needed help, you know, I want to give that back some way, somehow. I think that 
the events of this summer have really put a spotlight on Dayton. But I think that if anybody were to follow up from these stories, they would see how we've recovered. I think it's called the Gem City for a reason, because it really is a gem. You saw what Dayton really is. They're a very strong community of people who pull together and help each other. This is the community that we love. I will never question that after this, after what we've been through. The amount of love that the city of Dayton has shown is immense. It's just, you can't, it, it's, it's huge. It's just huge. In one word, how would you describe the city of Dayton? One word. One word, huh? Oh, that's a tough one. Oh, Dayton is gritty. That's why I love it. Support. Loading. Courageous. Love. Supportive. For me, it means power. Home. Yeah. That's a good it's... one. Dayton is home. Awesome. Resilient, maybe? Resilient. Resilient. I think we are resilient. Resilient? After everything, I mean resilient. Resilient. Is there another word for resilient? 